I was thinking of a song from the 1970s, I think it is. What have you done for us lately? 8% growth for uh, better than a decade long. Uh, you've got a referendum or a mandate to continue uh, institution building from your people. We'll talk about the political landscape going forward. Uh, with this much in terms of political headwinds, but more importantly, economic headwinds that are taking place in the world today, uh, are you confident you can sustain growth in this window of 7 to 8 percent going forward? That's kind of the expectation and the benchmark set for Rwanda. Well, thank you. I think we can continue to sustain growth in Rwanda because mainly this growth comes from within rather than from outside. Even though the outside investments uh, are well uh, welcome, are welcome and needed, uh, we start from inside and then uh, leverage what we have domestically in terms of security, stability, the rule of law, and the energy and resilience of Rwandans to then attract outside investments and move from there uh, into the future we want. Now, middle income status by 2020, let's define it what it means by per capita income in U.S. dollars, if you can, but what needs to happen between 2016 to 2020 uh, for you to get there, would you say? Well, we want to be at 1,240 U.S. dollars GDP per capita by 2020. We are now close to 800. So what remains of 400 plus or 500, we think we can meet that target by 2020 given the pace at which we've been moving, growth rates of 8% for the last 13, 14 years or so every year, we think we can still meet the targets. Good. What's the driver here? What's the key driver? I know you have an investment package to give uh, more independence to the uh, Rwandan Investment Board, if you will, yes. and you have legislation pending in the mining sector. Yes. Uh, I know you're emphasizing the farming or agriculture sector because it reaches so many different people in the country. These are kind of pillars, if you will, of good governance, but what needs to happen in 2016? Some of those laws have been passed, and I know there's some that are pending as well. The laws that we need to have in place have been passed, but this is building on what we've done in, since uh, the year, say, 2000. We've seen a lot of progress in building institutions, strengthening them, service delivery, has been very significant, involving the Rwandan people in all different productive sectors. So 2016 is really focusing on building on what we have already done in terms of the stability we have created, the macroeconomic stability that we have achieved, and making sure that agriculture is something we continue to develop and uh, make commercial to benefit the many Rwandans who depend on it. Manufacturing, services, these are areas we are targeting, but Rwandan Development Board, which has been some kind of interface between government and the private investments coming from within or from outside. The laws are now in place to make it fully operational uh, in this kind of area that is going to be very significant for us to achieve this. Now, I was looking, and we had a chance to discuss this behind the scenes before coming out, at a Fitch ratings report that has you a B plus with a stable outlook, <clears throat> suggesting that your growth can still be maintained, budget deficit under control around 4.5%. Mm -hmm. But these are all numbers. What people are looking for today is how do you replace the donor support because you're almost the darling of East Africa. People are willing to give you that transitional donor support, but it's going to be chipped away and coming down to 20% of GDP as opposed to 38 to 40% today. Are you prepared for that transition where the donor support is going to be, re be reduced in the next two years in particular? Donor support uh, wasn't something we really wanted to rely on forever. The donor support was there to help us uh, build our foundations, the institutions, the different fundamentals to be in place so that we can sustain our economy 
based on what we can do ourselves, but also uh, within the region. For example, regional integration, seeing more trade within the East African community and between the East African community and other regions, and then these continued uh, investments flowing into the country is something that is gradually helping us to fill the gap left by donor support over time. This is ultimately really what we want to achieve. Our vision is to make sure that we are able to stand on our own feet and develop our country and uh, uh, do attract investments, do business, and, and this is going to be more sustainable than uh, uh, donor support. Yeah, it's a very critical window. I, I don't have to talk to you about the uh, economic challenges that are awaiting in 2016 and 2017. I'm not speaking of Rwanda, but I am speaking about the African continent, which was enjoying, as you know, a renaissance because of the commodity demand, in particular from China, which is going through its only uh, new phase of slowdown right now. How do you keep pace with the reforms that you want, breaking foreign direct investment to a billion dollars, when we clearly see that the emerging market growth that we enjoyed for the last 10 years uh, is slowing down insignificantly. You can see what's happening in Nigeria, for example, because of the fall in oil prices in West Africa. Honestly, if you look at, for example, the trade between African countries, which is close to 12%, there is no reason why we can't grow it to the levels we see in uh, North America or Europe, which is 40, 63 percent respectively. And that has a huge potential mm. to fill these gaps that uh, are really created by the low prices uh, of commodities on which many countries have depended. So there is no reason. For, for us in Africa, we are continuing to look at integration. What is it that we can do within uh, our own region and re across regions, the COMESA, SADAC, West African organization, which Nigeria belongs. And I'm sure each country is looking at alternatives, and there should be alternatives even from the beginning. So I think these pressures are also having a silver lining around them. I think countries are going to think hard as to how they can diversify their economies and stop being dependent on commodities. Do you see yourself almost uh as the Singapore of East Africa, or even the Singapore uh, of Africa uh, as a continent. My, what I'm suggesting here is that small is good. I mean, it's easier to manage a much smaller economy, but it creates its challenges because you don't have the large consumer market in which everybody wants to invest in, unless they have confidence in the regional zones that you're talking about here. Do you see yourself, is it a, is it a fair analogy to be the Singapore of Africa? Well, what is good is not necessarily small what is good is good management of whatever you have, whether it's small or big. And there are many examples to learn from. We are happy to learn from uh, Singapore as an example, UAE is another example, and we work with Singapore and UAE, and we share best practices and learn from what they have done to be where they are, which their basis on good management of uh, the economy, of politics, and a combination of the two. So we think we can leverage good management uh, and good governance domestically, as well as continued integration and actually reap from improved governance uh, across Africa in different countries. Uh, governance is improving, and I think this can contribute to Rwanda if we properly manage our economy, our politics, and then integrate more with our neighbors and beyond. I, th I think the opportunity is there and the potential is huge. Now you brought up politics. I was thinking of the analogy politically of Lee Kuan Yew, who was like almost the father of the state. Having led for a long, long time, he decided there was a period of time that he leads from behind, that the governance structure was strong enough without Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, there's a lot of concern, should I put it? How, should, how do you want me to classify about the referendum, which you got 98% in December, that allows you to run for a third term? 
Is it healthy for Rwanda to have you stick around for a, a third term? I think it is very much healthy for Rwanda in as far as this is the choice of the Rwandans, not just my choice or anybody trying to dictate to Rwanda what should happen in Rwanda. I think as long as it is anchored in the wishes and the will of the people of Rwanda, it is very healthy because ultimately building on the choices of Rwandans and uh, since they are the ones deciding this, I don't see any problem. And maybe it's a matter of time as well. You talked about Singapore and the Lee Kuan Yew, the choices that were made. Maybe it was because time had come. So you have to look at time, but you also look at what is being done in that time and what the challenges are. And that is exactly what is unfolding in our own country. But you see increased stability, you see continued progress, and I think it is because of uh, people's choices that uh, sometimes people ignore. Good. Um, not that the European Union or the United States has the blueprint for governance around the world. We're not going to say that the West should be the one determining Africa's fate, but they express a great concern of importing. It's important to foster a new generation of leaders and that the referendum, in fact, could chip away at that transition of power in Rwanda. Is that a fair comment by the European Union and the United States, in your view? Well, I... There's much the, more severe comments out there, as you know. So let's clarify it from your vantage point. I don't depend on those comments. I depend on the reality of our situation. Rwandans have their own country, own lives, own future to think about and manage. I think those comments, fair enough, you listen to those comments, you learn a thing or two, but at the end of the day, you've got to decide what you do for yourselves and for your country. And Later on, we'll be partners with these uh, countries that may have a criticism or two, but uh, are we supposed also to make criticisms about uh, these countries? I, I think we better reserve that effort to managing our own situation and, and uh, look at what is on the ground and believe it, because you must be able to believe what you see. What you see in Rwanda and where we have come from is continued progress. Yes. Well, I'd say it's, $7 million to $7 billion is pretty good progress. Yeah, absolutely. Because of your GDP growth. And ownership of... Uh, your future. All that is happening and our future by the people. I think if there's any doubt that the people of Rwanda own these processes and own the progress they have made, we can talk about that. So let's clarify. If I come back to the World Government Summit in 2023, will I still be calling you President Kagame? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Don't be so cagey. Maybe. No, I, what I'm asking is, you're gonna, are you planning to run in 2017? Let's uh, look at that when it comes to 2017. Okay. Yes. You're leaving the door open to it, I take it? Well, I, I'm leaving uh, it to Rwandans to keep deciding what they want to have and what they want to do. Good. It's interesting because there's a DNA I wanted to talk to you about. We have a session this afternoon, which my colleague Becky Anderson is chairing, about why nations fail. I wanted to turn it upside down here, if we can, and why nations succeed. What's in the DNA of a nation to succeed? It's not just geography, of course. It's not only the people, but it's about institution building and government. Yeah. Right? Uh, tell me, but I'd like to hear from Paul Gagami about why a nation fails or why a nation succeeds, because it was a really rough period, uh, period of time before 1994, and the transition's been remarkable in terms of building a nation. In fact, that, in a way, answers or that answer to that question will answer the question you have just been asking before that. Nations would fail if governments and people have not been working together to actually fulfill the expectation and aspirations of their people. Mm. That's exactly why nations fail. And therefore, I see that the success in Rwanda has been solely because of the understanding of the responsibility of government and the role of institutions that have to be in place and the people.
ultimately the people will decide, but you also participate in making sure that things that are going to happen or should happen will actually happen because of them. So nations will fail if they listen too much to what other people think about them or want them to do other than thinking of what they need to do for themselves. Mm. So the moment you concentrate on that, and, and there's nothing really wrong in that in itself. You have to make each individual person a stakeholder in the future. Everybody so matters, absolutely. Inclusiveness is the way to go. Even this growth we are talking about of our economy has led to growth uh, in other areas, has led to in development of everybody across the board because people have participated, they have been involved, and they have been beneficiaries of their own efforts. So this is how states are going to succeed if you have a leadership, you have a vision, you have participation of people, and they feel they are empowered to work towards their own aspirations. I think there's no doubt about that. Do you have concerns about what we've seen in the Congo or Burkina Faso in the last year with some leaders that didn't want to depart, uh, changes the constitutions in Angola, Algeria, Chad, Uganda. People were very optimistic about Africa all going in the right direction. There's worries that it's backsliding and that it'll hold back economic empowerment. Do you share these concerns that people have? Well, I don't know because uh, each country has got uh, its own uh, uh, merits or lack of them, if you will, in different areas. So it would be not correct to say because it has happened like this in one place, it's going to happen in another. Again, it's an issue of whether the people of these countries you're talking about, uh, I think whatever they are thinking and whatever they want to do, if they come out and say, we are really having a bad day because of this or that. Or then you would then then believe it. them, absolutely. Good. Do I wanted to finish on a note of bilateral partnerships and investment. Uh, it's interesting, I, I, most here at the summit would know the relationship between the UAE and Rwanda. We have a record amount of international participants at the government summit this year. Uh, the UAE, not a big population in terms of a, a country, Rwanda, not a big population, but they s share a similar DNA. Uh, and you're pulling in foreign direct investment in the hospitality sector, uh, DP World in the port sector, and you've told me you want to cross a billion dollars in terms of foreign direct investment. Why do these sort of strategic partnerships matter when you see like to like at the government level? Well, I mentioned to you how we very closely cooperate and relate with the UAE. Uh, and I said earlier, Singapore, a few other countries. And the UAE is making uh, good investments in our own country, in the areas you have stated. Uh, uh, Dubai Ports is uh, creating an inland port in Ikigari and helping us uh, resolve logistical issues that uh, we face as a landlocked country. Course, we yeah. see investments in hospitality sector and other areas of uh, uh, cooperation that have been helpful. The air routes now serving the two countries, and there are more things we, in the pipeline, we intend to do. Uh, and there are a lot of experiences to share and learn from, as you said, small countries, but small countries, in a sense, uh, I guess I am not uh, going to claim to be an expert on the uh, details or history of UAE, but looking, if you look at UAE, where it has come from 30 years ago, I think they have built great value uh, from scarcity, if you will. Uh, I, th I don't think 30 years ago people gave them a chance uh, as uh, today suggests. Mm. Uh, Rwanda, the same thing. If you look at where Rwanda has come from and the, the kind of value we have built over the years, almost from nothing to something that we can discuss and learn from our own experiences extending to other areas maybe that have similar problems uh, for people to learn from. I think there is pride in the, the cooperation and the investments we can make in each other across 
between Rwanda and the UAE and uh, other uh, similar uh, countries that uh, value their people, value the private sector, and, uh, you know, people who think that uh, the sky is even no longer the limit. <laughs> That's very good. In, in the spirit of uh, His Highness and the Prime Minister, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid last night, and the, and the reforms of government that he presented, give us a sense, just your three traits, it doesn't have to be a long answer because we're tight on time, oh. the three traits of leadership which you think drive your decision making on a daily basis, and then we'll wrap up the panel. Three traits that are very important to you when it comes to leadership. It's uh, thinking about the right thing to do and having the vision and the organization and the strategy to implement it, working with the people. Nice warm round of applause for it's a Paul a pleasure. Gunnar. Thank you very much. Nice to see you.